Hey everyone, how are you all doing? It's been a while since I made a new video. I was away at work and had some other stuff to do. Well, it did Platinum Assassin's Creed Valhalla. But now, I'm back. If you've been following my channel and have subscribed, then you know that I've been covering this game since the very start. It's been a while since the last trailer was released, and even though there wasn't much gameplay, it did give us a lot of insight into the story and world of FF16. There's a lot of stuff to uncover. So without further ado, let's break down the trailer. At the start of the trailer, we get to know that it has been 1500 years since the fall of some civilization. It has been 1500 years since the fall of our forebear. And we see some ruins jutting out of the sea. This could be the ruins of some ancient civilization or could be something else edited into the trailer. But if it is that civilization, it seems to have been an advanced one. In the Japanese trailer, it is said that 1500 years ago, mankind challenged the gods and as punishment, the world has been slowly dying. This means that the blight is a punishment from that 1500 year old battle and is still impacting Wallastia to date. Clive walks into these barren lands which are referred to as the Deadlands. He still has that mark on his face and this place does seem similar to the one that we saw in the very first trailer. So far it is not clear what the group calls itself and the meaning of the mark on their faces. They might be affiliated with some realm or might be mercenaries for hire. But I'm certain that Clive has his own agenda for being with them. Almost further now. But we're in the this guy at the front is Ramu's dominant and is rumored to be FF16 said. What's important to note here is that he doesn't have the same mark on his face and is thus not affiliated with that mercenary group nor Clive. But he does seem to know Clive for some reason. Same goes for this bulky guy who appears to be carrying Jill Warwick on his back. Middle of the Deadlands. The blight sucked this place dry. Trees, no birds, and no magic. From this dialogue, we finally get to know what the blight does. It sucks the land dry of any life and magic. But we still don't know what actually caused the blight to manifest. Here we can see that there is no trace of the markman Clive was with in the first trailer. It's just Clive, Ramu's dominant, the big guy with Jill on his back, and Clive's wolf dog, Torgal, who's all grown up since last we saw him. This could mean that those mercenaries were either killed, Possibly between that Shiva vs Titan battle, or Clive and party just gave them the slip. Darkness spreads as day gives way to twilight. The mother's flame now all but a flicker. From this we can assume that the darkness or the blight is spreading, and it also is affecting the mother crystals in some way, making them weaker. This could be part of the Deadlands or some other area entirely which has been ravished by the blight. This book could either be about the history of Alastia or about the events that take place during the story. We then see these magnificent shots of the Mother Crystals while it is mentioned that life cannot carry on without their blessing. And the crystals work their magic through us. You have been blessed, Joshua. Here the Archduke of Azaria mentions that the crystals work through the people and that Joshua has been blessed since he possesses the power of the Phoenix. It seems like a nice father and son scene where Joshua is being explained not to fear his powers. In the Japanese trailer, the Archduke says that it is Joshua who extends the power of the Mother Crystal to the people. So I guess that's just how Ether works, huh? But who shall claim their fading light? The Grand Duchy of Rosaria, bastion of tradition. At the very least. Here we can see a younger Clive being told to secure Drake's breath by his father, the Archduke. We must secure Drake's breath. However, in the Japanese trailer, the Archduke says to retake it. <laughs> this could mean that at some point in the past, Rosaria controlled Drake's breath and then the Iron Kingdom seized control. With the blight spreading through Rosaria, they want to secure the Mother Crystal as quickly as they can. The Holy Empire of San Brek. Where ambition is divine. If you saw my last trailer breakdown, you'll know that I mentioned that this person seems to be of importance and might be a general of the Holy Empire's forces. Turns out, he's of great importance. This armor-clad gentleman is Dion Lesage, the crown prince of the Holy Empire of Sanbrek, the leader of its noblest and most feared order of knights called the Dragoons. 
He is loved and respected by both his people and his troops and is known for having turned the tide of battle many times to their favor through his icon Bahamut, the King of Dragons. I also think this kid here has some significant part to play and is not being shown for some reason. The Imperial Banner shall fly over every city in storm. All shall bow. The Holy Emperor makes it clear that he wants to see his Imperial Banner fly over every city in storm, the western continent of Alastia. I also feel like Dion is conflicted in carrying out the Holy One's orders. The Dalmechian Republic, whose fortunes shift with the desert sands. Moving forward, we see the Dalmechian Republic. I instantly notice how the land is inspired by Middle Eastern architecture, but also it seems as this place has seen war. And what of our wise rulers, goaded into war without any thought as to what chaos it might wreak? Hugo Kupka, the dominant of Titan and an advisor to the Dalmechian parliament, can be seen here talking about how the rulers just jump into war without thinking of consequences. The Iron Kingdom forged in faith and fear. Their souls were sullied with the stain of ether. I merely cleansed them of their corruption. We then see Drake's breath in the Iron Kingdom, a small group of islands off the coast of Storm with the crystalline orthodox, an extreme faith that worships crystals, reigns supreme. This could be the head of that faith who speaks that he cleanses souls that are stained with ether. Since this faith considers dominance as abominations and any unlucky enough to be born in the Iron Kingdom are executed, it seems like this guy is just justifying their murder. Or the kingdom of Wulud, indomitable in its isolation. Benedicta and the mysterious guy. Well, now we know who he is. Barnabas Tarmar, the dominant of Odin. He is said to have arrived on the shores of Ash as a landless and titleless wanderer. So we don't really know who he actually is and where does he originally come from. It was a skill with the blade that won him a kingdom. Using his icon Odin, he was able to quell the rebellions of the local beastmen single-handedly, bringing the entirety of the eastern continent of Ash under his banner. The dark swallows more of the realm with each passing day, and as the fringes fade, the people flock to the mother crystals. From his dialogue, it is clear that he is well aware of how the blight is increasing with the passage of time, causing people to flock to where the mother crystals are located. Now, a couple of things. Could it be that regions in Velistia, which are not close to the Mother Crystals, are the first places to get afflicted by the Blight? Because we know Rosaria is, and they don't possess any Mother Crystal, and plan to secure Drake's breath in order to rid themselves of the Blight. If you look at the back, it seems like the water has been parted where Barnabas is walking. This could either be Benedicta using the power of wind to part the seas, or even Leviathan. The book then shows Phoenix atop some battle. I hope this book is not a chapter by chapter progression of sorts. Anyway, this later cuts to Rosaria being invaded by the Imperial Army in the year 860. From a single spark, will the land ignite? In the year 860. I don't know who this guy is, but he doesn't seem like a generic NPC. He is probably reaching out to the Archduke who gets beheaded by a Rosarian soldier. The Imperial Army will march upon Rosaria. It seems like there was a betrayal from within Rosaria, followed by the Holy Empire's invasion. And from the slaughter shall a new shadow rise. I kept thinking, why would San Breck invade Rosaria? They don't even have a mother crystal. But then, the Japanese trailer answered this question for me. This means Ifrit is an icon which came into being as a result of whatever transpired that night. It shouldn't even exist, at least with Phoenix around. No wonder this guy was surprised. Second icon of fire. But that's impossible. Their destinies black as night. We then see Joshua turning into Phoenix in a surge of emotion, walking towards his father's killer. Common beasts of great might should command respect, but instead has left us outcasts. The trailer then cuts to Ramu's dominant turning into Ramu, followed by other dominants transforming. We also hear Ramu's dominants say how their ability to command icons has made them outcasts instead of getting respect. This could mean that he's an outcast himself. And so I became their puppet. 
Here we can see a grown-up Jill along with some other people being mistreated by probably the victors of this battle. And so I became their puppet. And I think this is her explaining her story to Clive. This is Ramu's dominant. It seems he's slowly turning to stone. That is the price dominants have to pay and the fate that they cannot escape. Makes them think they have the right to use us, to leave us to die when our bodies are spent. She continues to ponder over them being used for their powers and then being left to die when all that power is spent, which is evident from this unknown person, which I believe is a former dominant, being turned to stone. I'll crush him! Flay him! Ah! We see Benedicta here in her semi-transformed state battling Clive. And then we see ice projectiles being launched by Jill in her half Shiva form, attacking the same soldiers who were kicking her around. The trailer then cuts to a semi-transformed Ramu and Garuda duking it out. Then Clive is seen battling Hugo in the same semi-transformed state. If you look at the top left, you can see that the yellow-orange bars are now different compared to how they looked before. Another thing introduced to the gameplay are these circle thingies. The different colors represent the icon powers equipped. See how Garuda is equipped here with her abilities and the arrow is on the green dots? When R2 is pressed, we see two new moves pop up, Rook's Gambit and Gouge. The moment Clive uses Rook's Gambit, the corresponding green circle fades and we even see the Gambit counter pop up. I love this shot, Clive taking on Benedicta with Drake's head in the background. Our boy Clive is slowly making his way towards the Holy Empire. And yet again we can see that with Phoenix equipped, the arrow is at the two red dots. Holding R2 and hitting Triangle enables Clive to use Heat Wave and the red dot fades. Here we see Clive use Shiva's Cold Snap to await Odin's Sword Swipe. Benedicta finally turns into Garuda full form and holds Clive in her hand. This is probably an in-battle cutscene. This is Barnabas as he conjures his sword and deflects the blue-eyed Ifrit's attack. Is this blue-eyed Ifrit Clive? Hmm. It is you who shall bow to me. I love how Jildis delivers this line. Very well. Come then. Show us the strength of your will. Barnabas seems to be speaking to Clive before the battle, asking him to show his will. He refers to himself as us, which means him and Odin. I guess that's how you get an icon's power. Okay, now this is important. There are seven icons here. Odin, Titan, Shiva, Garuda, Ramu, Bahamut and Leviathan all with angel-like halos on their heads. But there's no phoenix and no ifrit. Is upon you. And then we see this one, without a halo. Is this a hybrid of phoenix and ifrit? If not, then where are these two icons? Both these icons are featured on the FF16 logo, but not here? Something's amiss. The trailer then concludes mentioning the war of the icons. Now that was an incredible trailer. Lots of story and world building. Not much when it comes to gameplay, but I guess the last one had a lot of it. I've compiled some interviews and information that I'll share in an upcoming video. I hope that you all like my trailer breakdown. Share your thoughts below and subscribe today for more videos. See you in the next one. Take care. I do.